Another really cool little plant that uh, you saw in the video is this little native orchid from Australia. Um, this is Terrastylus newtons, and uh, in spite of the fact that it, it is just cool in and of itself, this plant is particularly cool for another reason, and I'll talk about that in a second. First, though, what I want to do is I want to show you something about the flower here. Usually a small fly or perhaps a mosquito, something like that, will land on this little hooked thing down here. That's the lip, that little tiny thing there. And it will crawl up into the flower like that, like in a curved pattern. And then there's a little hinge right in here. And as it crawls up there, it hinges and it swings shut and it closes the little insect inside this chamber and this is like a hollow chamber in here um, and the only way that it can progress is to go forward through the flower this way and then come out here and get out um, and free itself um, well <clears throat> this is a, an entrapment type flower and this is the way that uh, it ensures that it's going to be pollinated because the two little pollinia, that's where these pollen grains are up, are up here, the only way that the, the creature can get out is to go this way and so it's always going to hit those little two pollinia and so it's guaranteed to be uh, pollinated that way. What's also cool about this plant is lacking in pigments, in particular any uh, green and yellow pigments, okay? Not any the green pigment, obviously, which is chlorophyll, is still there, but it's highly reduced, okay? Uh, normally this flower is a kind of a brilliant green to dark green. It has browns and little purples in there and everything. Those are other little accelerary pigments that are normally in many flowers. Well, in some plants, that can be lacking. A truly achlorophorous plant is pure white or some other color other than green, uh, because green, of course, is the color of chlorophyll. Um, and many orchids have adapted to that kind of a lifestyle. Well, some of them are kind of in between, and that's what this plant is. Um, it, in fact, is what they call albiflora, which just means, basically, that the flower is albino, uh, so to speak. It's not an albi albino plant. If it were, that would be completely without chlorophyll. However, these leaves here normally are a much darker green, and in this plant, uh, they're also lighter green, which means that it has less chlorophyll than a normal plant. Little entrapment flower. Australia's got some crazy orchid pollination going on. There's things where wasps are being tricked into like having sex with flowers and pollinating them out. It's bizarre. Anyway, if you wanna look at some really cool stuff, check out some of the uh, pollination um, schemes that these flowers have on Australian orchids and you'll be really be amazed. And Anyway, this kind of an entrapment scheme is actually pretty common throughout the plant kingdom. Plants are not as dumb as we might think.
So in early spring, there are these ephemeral flowering plants, and one group is the genus Trillium, um, also known as the wake robins. Uh, this genus is uh, probably has the center of its distribution in eastern North America around the Appalachian Mountains, but can be found into Asia as well. Uh, what we have here is three different species. This is the uh, species native to, I believe it's just Illinois and uh, Missouri. This is Trillium verde. Uh, I actually grew these from seed. And um, down here is a little species from Japan. This is Trillium smallii. And this little guy here that I have is actually was in the genus Trillium, but now it has been uh, reassigned to a monotypic genus, meaning it only has one species in it, and that's Pseudotrillium rivale, which is native only to the Siskiyou Mountains and adjacent areas of Northern California. So Siskiyou Mountains, sorry, in uh, Oregon State, Southern Oregon State, and into the uh, northern uh, part of uh, California, adjacent parts. So uh, very limited distribution in the tiny, tiny little thing. Okay, so what uh, makes these plants unique? Uh, first of all, there's uh, they only have three leaves, and these leaves are actually not really leaves. They are bracts. So a bract is kind of like a modified leaf that's usually associated with a flower, almost always associated with a flower. So there is actually no true leaf in these, however you want to call that. Um, and uh, this species you'll see has no stem to the flower. Now compared to, look at the little pseudotrillium here, he's got this big long stem coming up, and so does the smallie eye. Um, so this separates the two different subgenera within the genus. Now of course, pseudotrillium is kind of out of it because it's not really part of the genus. Um, separates it into the two subgenera, which is the sessile or the stemless form, and then the stemmed form. Uh, of the plant. Anyway, cool little genus. Another interesting thing about this is the seeds are distributed by ants because at the top of each little seed there's like a little, God I'm forgetting what you call it, a little uh, like a food packet there made of lipids and proteins and plants, uh, the ants get attracted to it and they uh, take the seeds away. They eat that part, the seed is dropped and uh, the plant is distributed to a new area. Anyway, a cool little genus uh, and a little other related genus of Pseudotrillium blooming this time of year. You saw earlier on in this video uh, during late winter that uh, my tree ferns were in pretty bad shape. Uh, this guy here is the Saithia tomentosissima, or more accurately, Highland Lace, kind of an unknown plant. I wrapped them up, as you saw in the previous video. He lost most of his leaves. Now, this has been the first season where I've had this kind of leaf loss, uh, but this also was the roughest winter we've had in... Uh, since what was it, uh, January of 2016. So uh, that little wrapping method hadn't really been tested real well. It worked great for two years. The leaves came out in the spring, looked very good, a little bit of burning, but not much. This year was another, another story. Uh, however, he's growing new fronds, so he's looking great. So uh, I'm happy about that. You can't see, but right over easily, but right over here on my, off my uh, right shoulder, is uh, Saithia spinulosa, which is a, um, that's actually a native species, all right? So that exists even in the Kyushu area where I live, but not in this region. It only lives in a few pockets of relatively warm, uh, well, warm, kind of frost-free pockets. But even they have been hit hard in these last few years by uh, different frost events. So. Uh, this plant actually did worse than the uh, the native did worse than the non-native, so go figure. Anyway, it looks like it's going to be okay too. Growing some nice fronds. It's got two fronds coming out now, another crozier. So we're looking good. So all in all, not bad. Uh, also in the uh, carport, 
I had a plate of cerium uh, by Fricatum, which did fine uh, in the carport. A little bit of damage, but not too bad. That's the staghorn fern, right? And then back behind me here is another plate of cerium that uh, by Fricatum that stayed uh, in a more exposed position. And you'll see that it got hit a little harder. So let's run over there real quick now and see how it did. Okay, well, here's the uh, Platycerium bifurcatum that was out in the ice and snow a bit. Um, you can see in the video that I was trimming it and taking out all the really bad fronds, and I think I got most of them. There's a little bit of burn on some of these still. Not too worried about that. Um, you can see it also is growing uh, new fertile fronds as well as shield fronds. So I don't see a problem with this plant um, going forward. This is a cold, hardy, relatively cold, hardy, epiphytic uh, fern that is very spectacular. I mean, it's a big, big plant. So anyway, interesting that it uh, did okay. I've been growing this, by the way, since 2005. So this thing has been through some pretty nasty weather and, and made it through okay. Okay, three more things you saw me doing in the video was uh, cutting this uh, Camellia Sazanka, um, mounting this little uh, Dendrobium midulliforme onto this fence, and then of course cutting the crepe myrtle back here. Um, <clears throat> one of the ongoing problems with a uh, relatively small urban garden like the one that I have is that if you do have trees in the yard you have to be constantly at them uh, with uh, the pruning shears and you know for a lot of people um, you know that don't really understand what they're doing they just kind of get in there and chunk 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 or they get somebody to do it for them and you just really end up doing a hack job on all your plants so um, there's a <clears throat> you know there's a technique to it and there's also a lot a lot to do with timing uh, and frequency. So for each particular species, you've got to be mindful of that. So for instance, this uh, Camellia Sazanka is a fall blooming to early winter blooming tree. So it's going to form its buds sometime uh, over the late summer, early fall. And so that means during that time, you do not want to be pruning much, right? So you got to kind of lay off. So the best time of year to be pruning this guy is in late winter or early spring, and that's exactly when I go after this guy. Um, now, I was a little bit later this year than I wanted to be, but still, it's fine. Uh, every year, I have to go in and, of course, cut the long growths. I have to thin it because there's a lot of cross-branching. I have to cut out the cross-branching and then clearing out any dead material that's in there because if you leave the dead material in there, of course, you're running the risk of disease. So there's a lot of discussion about how do you prune a crepe myrtle. And <laughs> if I had to be honest about what I would say about pruning a crepe myrtle, I would say this, particularly if you have room. Don't prune it. Just leave it alone. Let it grow. Crepe myrtles in general stay fairly small, um, for a tree anyway. And uh, they will slowly increase in size, but they're going to stay a nice little neat tree. Now here's the problem. The problem again is if you're in a tight space like this, if for instance mine keeps wanting to grow out over the house or it wants to crowd out the other trees, the podocarpus, I have a big podocarpus tree here and then I have the sazanka of course. And um, so I have to control it and moreover it wants to grow over my neighbor's house and that's a real problem because then I'm encroaching on their uh, house and it's hurting their little awning there. So I've got to cut it. So what I've found out is that there is a kind of a, a comfortable in-between where uh, if you don't hard, hard prune it, it's not going to grow these big, crazy growths. Because a lot of times with the crepe myrtle, you'll see uh, people really hack it back, and they do it here as well. And that makes it shoot these big, whoom, you know, like meter long, sometimes two meter long sprigs that just go straight out, and they flower like crazy but then you got to go ahead and cut them back again and they just keep cutting them and cutting them and cutting them almost like a coppice right and then it just forms these gnarly balls of uh you know damaged tissue which is constantly regenerating new growth you get great flowering out of it but it looks like you know it looks terrible right and it's i don't personally I don't think it's healthy for the tree either 
So I've kind of come to a, um, a good uh, compromise with this tree here where, yeah, you know, I have to prune it, no choice, but I've learned to like kind of leave it alone and it's starting to get a natural crown to it now. And of course there's this new leader here as well that uh, after that old branch that I cut off, I cut off last uh, summer, um, I'm leaving that little leader there to grow another extra crown there that used to exist. So that tree is uh, actually looking pretty healthy, not bad. Okay, uh, story on this. This is a Dendrobium maniliformi, which of course is the native Dendrobium species here in this part of Kyushu. Can take very cold temperatures. In fact, this particular plant is uh, still on its native log. This is a uh, Anume tree, so that's Prunus mume, which I have one growing right here. Um, <clears throat> this was uh, cut from a friend's yard, so he just bought a property up in the mountains here that he's going to turn into an Airbnb. And um, I guess he didn't want that tree, or maybe he was just being nice and cut me off a section of this uh, lovely little dendrobium. So I'm looking at it thinking, you know, what the heck am I going to, I mean, I got a bunch of them in pots here and a few mounted in the trees as well. And I was thinking, what am I going to do with this thing? So I didn't want to tear it off there and have it try to regrow. So I just uh, drilled a hole into the bottom here and uh, stuck it onto this fence. Actually, I didn't even have to really drill a hole. Uh, there was already uh, dead wood in there, and so they were already just kind of boom, went right in, and so I could uh, mount it easily. So, anyway, it's kind of cool. I'm seeing a few, I think I see a few buds there coming. So this guy's probably going to bloom in about another month or so, or, well, I don't know. Well, we'll see. A lot of variability on that species. A few of mine are already starting to do some flowering up in the trees here, the early ones. Uh... <clears throat> but they'll bloom uh, all the way into May, almost early June, if I remember it. My latest one, I think, is really June. Well, uh, that's it for this video. Um, you noticed, obviously, that we started in a lot colder weather, and now here we are in the height of spring. So this video includes clips from uh, about f middle of February and then into now we're just begun April. Um, so I started doing this video series of my garden uh, about just exactly a year ago, right? So I think it was April 6, 2020 was when the uh, Japanese government announced, um, you know, a national crisis with the COVID situation. Um, <clears throat> and then we went into a I don't know what you call it. It's not a lockdown, whatever that means. But so, sort of like a semi-lockdown mode. And uh, I was doing remote teaching at university. And for about two months, I really wasn't doing much teaching at all. It killed me financially. Um, anyway, it gave me time to go ahead and get around the garden a whole lot more than I normally would. Uh, because normally I'm more busy. And uh, I really went after trying to get things right this year in the garden and the problem is is that uh, I found out very quickly that I couldn't keep up even with the extra time um, I was really running around trying to get everything done and uh, you know <clears throat> when you can't take care of a garden well particularly if you have a, a lot of different type of plants growing in pots and all kinds of different requirements which I do uh, you know, you're going to be pretty much run ragged. It's sort of like running a big nursery with a bunch of, you know, <laughs> I don't know how many plants I have, several hundred kids, right? Several hundred plants, I call them my kids. And, um, you know, trying to keep up with that, and, you know, it gets a little bit crazy, you know, trying to keep up with it is almost impossible. So um, I found out this year the hard way that I'm going to have to pare back on my collection a lot, and, you know, this is not my house. This is a rental house, so at some point, uh, I'm going to have to be leaving this place, and i got to start be thinking about um, what am I going to do in the future. So, that kind of came home this year. Uh, before I go, I'm going to go ahead and close out showing you a couple of these uh, slipper orchids. These are um, Paphiopetalums uh, from Southeast Asia. Uh, this is Paphiopetalum malapoense. Uh, it's a nice plant, good-sized plant. 
flower quality on this one is not so great. I suspect it is a wild collected plant. I bought it at a show, gosh, I don't know, back around 2007. So it grows well for me. It flowers every year. Usually the second flower doesn't do so great, so this is just going to meh. This one's okay, though. Really neat species. It has a raspberry smell to the flower. It's, it's very light, but it's uh, distinct. And then this guy here is a, a primary hybrid with Malapoinsy. I think this is Malapoinsy crossed Micranthum, maybe? <laughs> anyway, I'd have to check the tag. Uh, anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. And uh, don't worry, I will be back with more stuff probably in May, I'm going to guess. I'll put something out about one of our native orchids here. Okay, well, that's it. Uh, thanks a lot, and I'll see you in the next video.